How's it going? You're very welcome along to the Drury Buildings here in Dublin City Centre. We're here because it is Science Week 2018 and all this week Science Foundation Ireland is asking everybody to get involved in Science Week and to use the hashtag stop and ask some questions about the world around us. You can use that online now and they will actually answer you and they'll get back to you. So use the hashtag stop and ask and today we are stopping and we're asking and we're going to talk about weight cutting by athletes, weight loss, and just the general physical health of athletes right now, something we've talked a lot about on Off The Ball, and we have a brilliant expert panel with us this afternoon. They are Dr. Sarah Jane Cullen, thanks a lot for coming along, Sarah no, Jane, thanks. lecturer in sport and exercise science at WIT and a researcher with the Irish Horse Racing Regulatory Board, as well as that, tournament nutritionist for the Women's Rugby World Cup and also part of Team Ireland Sports Science and Medical Team at the Olympic Games in Rio and in London. There is a lengthy introduction for all of these people, <laughs> I will just warn you, they're all extremely well qualified. qualified. You've got the best one of all, Andy, it's perfectly fine, don't worry about it. We also have Dr. Richard Downey, ortho Orthopedic Surgery Senior Registrar at the National Spinal Injuries Unit at the Matter Hospital. As well as that, he's also a sports medicine doctor with the IRFU, the FAI and UCD and an IHRB Racecourse Medical Officer. And we have Professor Niall Moyno, who you'll all recognise from the telly. Uh, he's <laughs> also head of the School of Health and Human Performance and a member of the Centre for Preventative Medicine in DCU and our very own Andy Lee, former world boxing champion. <laughs> That's the one. <laughs> Anybody get them qualifications, Andy. Not anybody can be a world boxing champion. So we're going to get into weight cutting amongst athletes, in particular, I guess, focusing on mixed martial arts, on boxing, and on horse racing, and just the general health of athletes today. But Andy, you might tell us your story first in boxing and weight cutting. Was it something that, from a very early age, was just accepted? It was something you had to do? Yeah, you know, it's part of the sport. Um, and... I you always, as a kid, you don't think about it. You just fall. I used to just fight at whatever weight I was walking around at. But um, certainly, as as I progress as an amateur in, onto in international stage, um, I've had it both ways. Where there was a time when I used to fight at light middleweight, seventy-one kilograms, and they got they uh, got rid of that weight class um, to streamline the Olympic Olympic Games. And so I had a choice to to fight at either sixty-nine kilograms or seventy-five. And so I, had, I was in a scenario where I had to gain weight. It was a complete opposite from what I had been used to. But for the most part of my career, I fought at middleweight, which is 11.6 in stones, 160 pounds in, in pounds. And, uh, and what's your everyday every natural weight walking around Dublin well, three I months before no, a fight? I would, have been, I would have walked around when I was training and fighting at about 173. Okay. And then I would have in pounds, and I would have got down to fight at 160. There was two fights I had in 2014 where I fought at 154 pounds. Wow. That's 11 stone dead. Um, and I, I was nearly dead. <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, um, there is no real, I don't know, you guys, you guys can answer better. I don't think there's any clear cut science in, in the best way to make weight. I'm, I'm sure there's the scientific way of doing it, but then there's you know, every boxer and every individual has their own way of doing it the way they're comfortable. I found that. And, um, so you're walking around at 173, mm. you're getting down to 169.5. Yeah, for the most And part, what are you yeah. back up to then? So are you 173 on a Wednesday, 160 on no. a Friday, and back up to 173 no, on a Saturday be, for the fight? You train for the eight, 12 to 8 weeks, and all that time you're watching your diet, eating very clean. And you'd be, after training, you'd be probably finishing your training sessions at around 168 pounds. Come into the final week or so, you'll be finishing your training around 165, and then up to up to about 72 hours before the fight, you'd be 168. I would be 168, and then I would dry out. In the last 48 hours, I would dry out the last eight pounds. Right. Um, no 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 fluids, very small sips, very little food, and training, two sessions a day. And then also, more than likely, had to go into a sauna for the last pound and a half pound. Which actually seems quite moderate compared to a lot of the videos we've seen, a lot of what we hear about fighters trying to cut weight, where they're doing many, many sauna sessions in the 24, 48 hours beforehand. Did you find it a, I don't want to say an easy experience, something that was quite comfortable, or was it just something your body became used to quite quickly? It's something you have to do, and like making the weight, and just that's kind of like the first battle. And then you have to, to fight as a second battle. Mm. And or the final training session. Yeah, it's just, like, it. it's just like, 
I had that out of the way. And sometimes I made the mistake when I first made it 154 pounds, that that was all I was focused on, and that the fight was secondary to that. And I didn't perform well in the fight. Um, because once I'd made the weight, I just, I, I was, my discipline in terms of food went out, right. went out the window. But um, it's, yeah, it's, it's something you have to live with. But it's, I, it's, it's probably the biggest factor in, in injury in sport now. It's probably the most, you know, um, they can learn to really long-term injuries is cutting weight. And I think it's that, obviously, in, in combat sports, you're getting punched in the head or hit in the head. And so there's always that danger. But doing it while you're dehydrated, it's probably the biggest factor in sport and something that they're going to have to seriously take a look at. Because as, as athletes become more faster, stronger, fitter, bigger, um, you know, the science is changing of how we train and how we prepare and how we can lose weight, but the body isn't trained, the head and the brain doesn't ch change. You know, mm -hmm. we've been the same since for the last how many million years. So know? there's no sense that actually 20 fights in, your body sort of realizes 48 hours that, oh, here we go again, we're going no, through the is, process. Yeah, you, is, there, you do have that. And, and in some ways, it's very, it's very handy for a fighter because, not handy, but it's a useful tool because it kind of strengthens your resolve that you know you've sacrificed so much and you put yourself through so much. Um, that you know that when you get in that ring, you, you've paid the price, you, you know, and you're going to make sure you yeah. do everything not to lose. Um, I guess it's impossible to actually tell what the effect is on your body initially because you are going into a fight then 24 hours later where physically you're getting beaten up and any aches and pains you're automatically going to associate with that rather than the weight cutting and what happened in the 48 hours previous. Yeah. Um, so would you have ever felt the day of a fight? Just that 48 hours has really taken it out of me. It, you kind of, you, you might feel that, but you're always telling yourself the opposite. You know, you, try, you have to lie to yourself sometimes, mm. even if you're not feeling the best. And, you know, as a boxer, we would usually weigh in around 4 p.m., 5 p.m., sometimes a little bit earlier, and you're completely dehydrated, but you have to use that time. And that's, that's probably the most important and critical time from that, it's, it's over 24 hours because you know you usually fight around 10 p.m., mm. 11 p.m. The, net, the following day. So you had that time to rehydrate and what you put into your body from that, in that period is, that's the most important thing, you know, really. You have to make the weight right. It's, it's, it's like a lot of the best fighters, they have it down to a science in the way they do it themselves, you know. And did you have any level of qualified expertise advising you on your weight cutting, and then that next 24 hour period when you're trying to build your body back up as to scientifically actually, mm. this is something that's proven to help. I've done it every sort of way. Like my first coach, Emmanuel Stewart, he would have been very keen on keeping these fighters heavy and then dropping it for the final, only for like those like one or two hours before the weigh in, and then banging it straight back up. And so you have that physical advantage of being bit bigger than the person who's in the ring with, with you. And that's why everybody does it, you know, because they're fighting out of their weight categories and they're trying to get any edge they, they mm. can. And I've done it also where I've lost weight gradually in a build-up to a fight, and I'm sure that's what these guys would advise, the most healthiest way to do it. You know, gradually take your weight down to two pounds a week. And then, well, what I've found when I've done that, you wind up being very small physically and unable to put back on the weight because your body's adjusted and not your stomach is shrunken and your body's adjusted to being that lower weight. Then when it comes time to rehydrate, and eat and replenish yourself and, and get big again, you're unable to do that. And I've, like, um, so I've done it all the ways. So I found out towards the end that leaving it for the last 48 hours to dehydrate, not in any time before that, and bring it down to a certain level where I'm not too light, not too heavy, like finding a happy medium between okay. the two previous methods. And then what you put into your body after, after weighing, I've, I've mixed with and, ch and changed over the years and, what I would usually do is, what everyone does, and the biggest mistake I can see that they do is when you, as soon as you weigh in, they grab the bottle and they gulp, 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 because that's all your body's just crying out for fluid. It just wants to soak it like, like a sponge. But it's probably the worst mistake you can make, I think. I don't know, maybe these guys have, I, I found that when I've done that, I've been very, like, obviously you fill, this up, fill up with water, you're not able to eat food, and I think you flush out some of the digestive enzymes in your stomach. With that, I'm not sure, maybe you guys should tell me better, but I just kind of found this way. And not being able to digest my food yeah. and find myself very full and not able to have two or three meals after a way in. So before we get into the real technical side of it then, Niall, you do a lot of physiological studies of athletes. How much research has been done into 
the effects of weight cutting? Well, I suppose my first introduction to this was when I lived in America, and particularly in wrestling. And what used to amaze me, you know, the guys would cut the weight, oh, we cut the weight. And if they stayed their normal weight, they would have ended up wrestling against each other anyway. Mm. And I'm sure in boxing it would be the same. I don't know why they do it, because yeah. they're all going down two categories, and then they, they put the weight back on, so it, 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 it amazes me. But really, in the last 15 years, nutrition is now a really exact science. Mm. And at the level that Andy was at, you're talking about an individual. And no two individuals are the same. What worked for Andy may not work for someone else. And what the coach has to find out, what specifically works for his or her athlete. And what we now know is, when you eat any macromolecule, a carbohydrate, a fat, or a protein, it switches on, um, we call it a regulator. So say it switches on a transcription factor that goes to the nucleus of your cell and tells your cell to do something. Now, whether you take a carbohydrate, the response would be very different if you take a fat, even the type of carbohydrate. That's how exact it is now. And every single individual is different. And they probably, boxers, break every single rule that we would ever teach a student about nutrition. You know, you have the pre-competition nutrition, you have the competition during your fight, and then you have your immediate post. You guys break every rule in the book. And I think we need to sit back and reflect. And I think performance, I think, could be greatly enhanced if we took, I, I would put some, and they did this in the States, they put a regulation in about the amount of weight you were allowed to, to lose. Now, we, we'll talk about jockeys in a few moments, mm. even you guys. What you were losing is nothing compared to the mixed martial arts guys. Mm. They're losing seven to nine kilos. You know what I mean? It just can't be healthy. And we also know now that something called metabolic flexibility. If you eat a carbohydrate, you sh your metabolism should be able to switch on to burn that carbohydrate. If you eat fat, you should actually be able to burn the fat you lose that metabolic flexibility if you continue to weight cycle chronically. And I think, think long-term, we don't know what the outcome is, not just on the performance, but on their overall health as well. And have you had fighters, MMA fighters, boxers, come to you to ever talk about that 48-hour period of weight cutting and trying to get the weight back up? Because what you're saying, Andy, there is you're trying to get that age. You're trying to end up in the ring bigger than the guy aside well, from you. Like, that if you actually were to go and do all the studies, do you think you could actually break it down individually for each person as to what works for them? Yeah, well, I mean, the holy grail of, of, of medicine and physiology is the in, like, same with, with medication, is to individually tailor, like, you get a heart attack, everyone gets the same four drugs. Well, it might work for 299, you don't need them all. But that's the, sort of, it's a one-fits-all approach. But at the level, I mean, we're talking, we're talking minuscule percentages here to be a world champion. Mm. And those are the small percentages that make a huge difference. And I think it's, it's, the, it's the, the athletes in the future who really buy into this, because the science is there. It's not as though you have to go into a lab and spend three hours. You can get the results now in 10 minutes. So I think, I think in the future, it'll be a lot more individually tailored and a lot of the guesswork. Now, the great coaches, I mean, as scientists, we learn from the coaches. You know, they learn through trial and error, and then mm. we tell them why it worked. But I think that will be reversed now with science will be able to actually give you a lot more information. What's mm. unique about your genotype, you know, that allows you to put on weight or lose weight, the rate at which you should actually lose it at to, op to optimize your performance. Richard, on the level of research that's done then, do we have any idea of what sort of long-term effects, if any, there are? Um, well, they all, they all have a... They only do this for a certain period of time, and uh, you'll probably find Andy doesn't quite walk around now at the same weight that he used to way, when he anyway. was boxing. <laughs> um, there's some fairly high-profile racehorse trainers who used to be jockeys, and there'd be a couple of X's before the large and their clothes, so some of them make up for it very afterwards. Uh, it, I guess it depends on the, the level that the, the level of severity and the mm. longevity that they are cutting weight. Um, the research in the, in the long term, Sarah Jane might fill us in on some of the, the stuff the horse racing board are doing now with their younger jockeys. And it's very much education now to prevent rather than us researching what happened the guys who went before. Yeah, it, it feels as though the horse racing board are trying to get on top of this and there's probably still a long way to go, whereas maybe boxing and MMA are still the Wild West sort of and it's up to coaches, it's up, very much up to the individuals as to how extreme they want to go. Yeah, I, I would say that. And just, I know this is beyond the science, but th to me there's an air of uh, desperation and insecurity about fighters who feel like they have to come down so far because they don't trust their technique and, and their own fighting ability. So they feel the only advantage they can get is to come from, come from such a high weight to get that, uh, that they yeah. have a size advantage. So they're fighting somebody, you know, three quarters their size. Or, yeah. Um, Andy, how much of your big fights 
How much better do you think you could have performed if you hadn't been weighed beforehand? Oh, like, I, I always felt like the week before and when I was sparring, the week before fight when I be 168, I thought, you know, I'm absolutely flying here. And there would always be that, you see, you can't, you have to figure in, obviously, it's, it's a fight, it's a lot different from sparring, you're not in the comfort of the gym, and there's all that familiarity where you're in a fight, you're thrust into this, with an opponent who's equally as good as you, and you're, there's a performance aspect in terms of the crowd. So that, all of those things that affect your performance in, in that sense, but I always felt at my best, you know, physically and performance-wise in training at around 168. And I could, I could have been a super middleweight, but I would have been fighting guys coming from 190 pounds, maybe 200 pounds, you know, and it would have, they so would have been up there. So it's just this circle. So you just have to, you, you have to do because everyone's yeah. doing it. And everyone's doing it because everyone else is doing it, you know. It's, it's just, it just that feeds into the surf, yeah. Sarah Jane, horse racing is obviously very different then because with boxers and fighters, you're dropping and then you're trying to get back up as quickly as you can. Whereas in horse racing, it's a constant. You want to be down low. A lot of jockeys are out probably 300, 320 days a year and they need to keep their weight down. Are the effects from what you've seen from the research and from being around horse racing different? Is there anything you're hearing here? Is it a very similar process? of the way that they actually make weight and drop mm. down. Yeah, because horse racing, as you said, it is so unique. Do you know, as in their weight, like as they walk out to the race and if they place their weight on the way back in, so they don't have time to, you know, replenish and refuel. And even that they have a couple of races throughout a day, every day, as you say. So I suppose the work that we're doing is looking at the jockeys now at the moment, how it's affecting their health and performance. So we have some research going on looking at their bone health. And I suppose a large proportion of jockeys have um, osteopenia, which is the stage just before osteoporosis, which is quite worrying that you've got this high risk sport, they fall off. Do you know they're more at risk of breaking a bone then? Uh, we have another uh, PhD uh, student looking at mental health of jockeys. So I suppose looking at, at the moment, you know, what is their mental health status as well? And there is, like, from uh, studies that we've done, there is kind of, I think it's one in two are displaying symptoms of depre depression. Now, that's not saying they are depressed. It's just at that time. So maybe they were making weight at that time. So uh, that's kind of where our research is at the moment, particularly mm. in bone health and mental health. And there are issues that we need to look after. And are you putting together a link between the jockeys who are showing problems with their mental health and weight cutting, that that's one of the biggest issues they're facing? Uh, so Lewis King's a researcher at the moment and that's what he's looking at. So he's kind of trying to do a study at the moment to link that. Mm. Previ previous work we've done, we haven't linked it. Um, so we're just trying to see, is there an effect there to see, is weight cutting actually one of the risk factors associated with it? Is there advice for jockeys on weight cutting and how to do it properly if there is a way of yeah, so doing it properly? Yeah, so I suppose uh, the IHRB started funding the research back in 2005. So since then, you know, we've had loads of PhDs, uh, masters and postdocs. And as a result of that, we've had a jockey pathway program. It's like an education and support system that HRI are funding that's been put in place. So all like licensed jockeys are entitled to support, be it like the strength conditioning with Wayne Middleton, uh, diet like diet advice with Gillian O'Loughlin, who's an IHRB dietitian, and then uh, Dr. Carol Velocity, the sports psych. So jockeys have those services available in the racing academy that they can, you know, ring up and actually attend. It's just trying to get them on board and get them to want to do that. So we're at the very early stages. Yeah. Again, it's probably that group think that, well, nobody else is doing it, so why would I do it? This has worked for jockeys for decades. Yeah, yeah. Why change? Yeah, and I suppose that's the research is directly kind of informing what we're doing. So everything is evidence-based, but it's just, I suppose, to get them in. And you have the same crew coming back over and over again that do want help. Because mm. I suppose a large proportion, particularly the younger lads, like they are struggling with their weight. They can't... Um, like even when we look at the racing academy, the average uh, weight of the trainee jockey entering the racing academy over the last 40 years has increased by 50 odd percent. I think it's 51 percent. But the average weight of the minimum weights for flat riders has only increased by 10 percent. So there's no match there. Like, you know, the guys are getting bigger. They can't mm. make them. So that seems like quite a simple fix, though. Uh, you'd like to think so, yeah, but we're st like... Well, what's the, what's the hold-up? What's the problem that they aren't increasing the minimum weight? Oh, yeah. we've tried. They, yeah, they have increased them um, in the last few years as a result of the research, but like at the moment, the average 14-year-old can't even make the weight for the flat guys. And if you look at it, only a quarter of the apprentice guys, the newer jockeys, can actually meet them, can avail of their full claim as such. And a fifth of the professional guys are meeting the minimum weight. So we're, they're struggling, aren't they? They are, yeah. The weight cutting that mm. you spoke about, Andy, you have time to rehydrate and replenish and the jockeys have to be a certain weight for whatever ride they're about to take. Mm. So 
they weigh out for their event, for, for their performance at a certain weight, and then they get weighed in immediately afterwards. And there's a very small margin allowed, about a pound or so over. So if they have to weigh out at 10 stone, they have to get on the horse with 10 stone. When they come back in, they still have to be 10 stone or 10 stone one pound. They're allowed a little bit extra on a really mucky, dirty day if it's a three just mile jumps in, race. Just to put it into context, when you're at that kind of, when your body's at that kind of body fat percentage, low body fat percentage, that a pound is probably 600 mils of water, isn't it? It's probably, f that, that's, that's, 0 .5, that's 0 0.5 of a kilogram there. You know, that's half a kilo, just drinking that. And you can drink, like when I would be cutting weight, if I drank that, I would be half a kilo heavier. Mm. So that's, there's not much in it, you know, like talking about rehydration and what you can put into your body. You guys might not agree with that, but that's, that's, what, that's, that's the way it is when you're, when you're on those fine margins of like being at that, that level of dehydration. Can I, can I ask, was there ever a fight because of your, your, your weight restriction um, that you felt I didn't perform out there? There was times when I came in too light when I've done too much, you know, and lost too much weight. Um, but no, I would never say there was a one fight when I made it the first time when I made 11 stone, uh, 154 pounds. And as I said, I, I thought making the weight was the, was the fight. And I was, wasn't against a top class opponent. It was kind of like a trial run at the weight. And after I made the weight, I went in there. I didn't eat the right kind of foods and I didn't perform well. But that would be the only case. And did you ever feel you ever lost strength in the ring because of weight? No, 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 no. And what about when you were at your lowest weight just before weigh-in? What, what, oh. what were you capable of at that stage? Were you, were you just wrecked? Mentally, were you mentally, yeah, mentally drained, physically drained, and not, you don't even want to speak to people. And, tell, I, and there is definitely, life. yeah, there is, <laughs> like what you say, um, if they're doing it on a consistent level and you talk about links to depression, I would say it's, it's, there's definitely serious links there because it's, it's just, not only that, your mood swings are mm. in, incredible, you know, like they just go, you go from chatting, all of a sudden you don't want to talk to anybody and you're just the most crankiest person in the world. And it is a miserable, it's a miserable thing to do, you have to deny yourself all the time. You know, food, it's, it's, it's just, it's pure misery. And from a boxer's point of view, so it's a 48 hour process, then you go, mm. you replenish, you have your fight, and then you're probably not fighting again or in camp for a couple of months. You can let loose, like you probably don't yeah. want to go well, that's full it. Ricky food, Hatton no, on it, no, but, but you can, you can go and enjoy life for a little all while. All ex-boxers, and you've mentioned ex-horse, ex, uh, uh, now horse trainers, yeah. Mm. Um, food is your only vice, in a sense, you know, in that kind of way, when, especially when you're an athlete, you can't, mm. you don't drink much, you don't smoke, you don't do anything else. So food is kind of the only thing you have just to like, just to <laughs> give yourself some reprieve to blow off steam, you know, mm. and, and some people take it to the extreme. Yeah, I'm sure everyone has seen the Tony McCoy documentary as well. After 20 years and still having to do the sauna, still do the weight cutting now, McCoy is an exception in terms of, I think, probably his mental strength and how he could go and do it again and again. But there's jockeys out there who aren't as successful, who probably don't have the resources, or even, actually, maybe the resources is an interesting issue because we've done a O'Brien on recently who is champion jockey, and maybe he's brought it into focus because his brother Joseph was such a successful jockey, had to give it up because of its height. Dunica looks as though he may be heading the same way. He's a very tall individual. And I would have assumed he had the best of everything, he, that he had all the research. You're talking about Bally Doyle, a billion-dollar industry. And he's actually saying, no, nah, like, just I don't really eat anything. I think his quote was that, in the last 24 hours, he'd had a few jellies in the can of Red Bull, and that was it. He said a mouthful of Red Bull. <laughs> <laughs> mouthful of Red Bull. But he, he literally said, if I was on a healthy diet, I'd be too heavy. Yeah, no, he would, certainly, yeah. The, the, the situation Andy found himself at weigh-in, that's the way the jockeys find themselves just before they perform. Now, for some of them, and for a lot of them, they're actually at the, at the walking around rate, weight a lot of the time, and occasionally for a handicap, so most of the races that you see on TV or at the races every day, most of the jockeys are doing the weights relatively comfortably for them. And then the handicap is the best horse has mm. the most race, most weight. And as you go down towards the bottom, the handicap or the weights become less and less. And certainly jockeys will really cut weight and punish themselves to make a handicap. Um, and, and, and on those occasions, they're going out and, and sometimes very dehydrated, very hungry. They fall, they get beaten, they get abused by punters, um, and then they, they can't make up afterwards and have a big dinner because actually there's another race tomorrow where they need to do the same weight. 
Um, and they're all on different levels and s s some of them have kind of for their long-term health benefits mm. some of them have said you know what I'm never pushing myself below 11.7 and because of that they can't ride as often um, their income goes down and this is something they all do for a living you know yeah it, I, I just thought because it was done at Cobrain, it was so striking in that like they wouldn't treat their horses the way they treat their donkeys. Yeah, they, no. they would give no. them, they would make sure they have the best of absolutely everything. They, there was no way they would let them go out on the course unless they were 100% perfect. Whereas jockeys just have to suck it up and put up with it. Yeah. And a lot, I remember hearing someone describe a jockey as a postage stamp on a horse, as if they've no role to play. Like, do you know, but they're performing out there as well. Do you know, it's, mm. and it's that kind of dual partnership. You're relying on having a good horse and then you doing your best up on that horse. And then as you were talking about being under scrutiny, like they come back in and they have to, you know, talk through the race with the trainer and the owner and then get abused, as you say, sometimes on social media. And they might not even have performed bad. Maybe the horse didn't, but it comes back on them. And they might miss out on opportunities then in the future. So, Is your expectation game. that the minimum weights will just continue to rise and rise? No. Um, I, we would all like them to, and that's what we're trying to push for at the moment. But if Ireland do it, then jockeys are struggling elsewhere because a lot of them would go race abroad. So we really need an international consensus for that, and that's not happening at the moment. So I suppose that's, we are pushing for that. But and what are the reasons for the opposition? Uh, apparently not good for the horse. So, right. but at the end of the day, all you'll see is lower races. But it's not like you're looking at the hundred meter like sprint and you have a world record. You're looking at whatever how the horse can perform on the actual day. And even that morning, sure, riding work and pushing the horses out and training. You've got the heavier lads riding them anyway. Mm. So really, I don't know why the guys have to cut such low weights. Like, you know, it's not influencing it that much. They'll all be at the same. Certainly, field. the flat is where the big aim to reduce mm. the minimum weight is because they're the ones. The heaviest flat jockey would be able to ride at the minimum jumps uh, weight a lot of the time. Internationally, it's a problem in America. There's a huge portion of Mexican jockeys in America where they're well able to make the weight. And the, the Americans, a lot of the Irish guys going over to ride Irish horses in America, sometimes they can't ride. They're over at the race course because they're riding a, a different horse for their Irish trainer, but they have to get a local jockey or mm -hmm. a different jockey because they can't make the weight. They don't really have the same problems over there. I'm not sure why France and Great Britain aren't as keen as Ireland are to increase the weights. Um, I guess some of it is horses are compared to what their predecessors did, and you know they they say that the breeding of race horses or flat race horses was based on the finish post at Epsom, and that was the ultra aim. And you, if you could probably find on, on Wikipedia the, the, the time that it took for every single Derby winner to run the exact same course. And maybe they, they, they don't want to dilute it because mm. the Derby's 10 seconds slower because the jockeys are, are on top of them are, are carrying more weight. But ultimately, I, I would believe that the humans on the horses are slightly more important than the record books. So You're hopefully. trying to change a whole culture, though. Do you know, it's all based on tradition. Back uh, around, like when the Racing Academy first opened, you had to be 15, five foot and five stone to enter. Now, like you have to be at least, I, I think it's typically between 16 and 18 and nine stone. So like, as in, how have we gone from the five, sto five foot, five stoner to a nine stone and not change the weights? Yeah. So you're trying to change a whole culture. Um, Richard, what sort of effects are you finding from treating jockeys? from weight cutting, or is, um, it, is, it, is it still too early to say exactly what, what the link is? Um, anecdotally, without specific research, guys get a fall and they're in the back of an ambulance after falling and you're chatting to them, trying to ascertain, are they sore anywhere? Did they get a head knock? Do they know where they were, what they were riding? Certainly, uh, you know, guys can be a, a little bit more down on themselves or they feel falls a little bit more on days that they're doing light, as they would say themselves. Um, so certainly there, I bet Andy, if you were thrown into the ring immediately after your weigh-in and you and another guy box <laughs> the heads off each other compared to after you've had a day, and a day and a couple of hours and eating and drinking, you'd have a vastly different experience of any of the trauma that you'd take. Yeah, well, the, it wouldn't be a spot of boxing if that would be the case because the fights wouldn't last around, you know, there would be, Just about. They'd be horrible. But there was like years ago in the 50s, just a weigh-in on the day of the weigh-in, but they, because people were dehydrating, and that, that could, you know, people say, why don't you just weigh in at the fight, mm. you know, before the fight, but what you would have then was, you'd have athletes re dehydrating immediately before, and you'd have that scenario there where guys were going into the ring. So they've tried to change it to make it 24 hours before, for at least 24 hours before a fight, but then, now, you know, everyone's trying to get that edge, so they come from such, such a high weight down.
not if somebody came to you in DCU and said, I'm planning on weight cutting, I'm, I'm going into MMA, what would, what would your advice be for them? Uh, don't go into MMA to start with. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I would really sit them down and say, look, you know, obviously they see the here and the now, uh, it's instant gratification, but the long-term impact to be losing such phenomenal weight, um, the impact it can have on the long-term health. And I know what, no athlete you know, is interested in what's going to happen 10 or 15 years down the road. Mm. And that one of the big issues for me is that we don't have long-term, longitudinal research on the same people over a long period of time. It's, it's sort of, we take little uh, cross-section views at various periods of, in time. It would be nice um, to take a, a totally different approach. And if you look at track and field, track and field had to do this with the javelin because they got so good and so strong, the javelin was actually going the full length of the infield. <laughs> so they had to change the design of the javelin. The javelin became heavier. And so all of a sudden, the world records stopped. And I agree entirely. We have to take a totally different approach and put the athlete you know, first and foremost. I think with, with, with losing weights that they're losing in MMA, that's frightening. And I think I would not advise anyone to lose more than mm. you know, three kilos. But to be losing eight and nine kilos, I mean, that's negligent. You know, uh, you know, if someone came, in, came to you and asked you, can I lose nine kilos before an event, and you tell them you know, to wise up, even the fluid around their brain, that, that dehydration, you talk about increasing the risk for injuries, it's absolutely dramatic. So if they came to me, I would have to, to decline the offer. So you would say three kilos is a healthy amount to dehydrate or, or, or lose? To lose. To lose, not to, to dehydrate. Yeah. Well, and and de you wouldn't, obviously you wouldn't advise dehydration in any no, sense. No, because the, the, you yeah. remember your body is 70% water. It needs that water for, my, for the functioning of, of all your physiological systems. I mean, and that's evolved over millennia, four billion years. Why would you want to mess with that? So I, again, it comes back to me, is that why do people not compete at their normal weight and stop all this nonsense? There could be a is, way, surely, of... You know, you, you are, you're a weight class, but you have to have a certain urine osmolality to s signify that's pro or you, you may yeah, know yeah, of yeah, more yeah. accurate ways of analyzing somebody's hydration status and that a certain amount of it, you can't cut below a certain level of dehydration or, or you don't make the weight and that would maybe be a well, way you of... you had these fights that generate millions sometimes mm. up to close to a billion, you know what I mean? Well, you not, could, no one's going to... No, yeah, 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 yeah that's before. it, it's not clear. <laughs> They do do that in horse racing now for the apprentice guys coming on. You're set a minimum weight. So the guys would go into Gillian O'Loughlin when they first want to take out a racing license and they're weighed in and they must be hydrated. And then she kind of gives them a realistic target of what they can get down to and they've six weeks to go away and they're given a diet plan. They come back in six weeks, but they're only set that weight if they're in a hydrated state. So they're not allowed to accept any rides below that, which then rules out some rides that can't get races, but at least we know for the newbies coming on board there is a minimum weight. Yeah, I think Andy hit the nail on the head earlier. You, you were saying normally a week before you're, you're, you were, you were, and in, you know, that was wasn't. it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would have some sort of a rule that whatever your average weight was, you know, for the 10 days or for a certain period of time, that's the weight you must, you must fight at. Because that's your normal weight. That's what your body expects. Mm -hmm. that's, what your, that's what your physiology expects. Yeah. And, and, it's, and it's your as you said, that's when you're at your, your, your best. Yeah. I guess the problem with all of this is that sports people are inherently selfish and don't think long term in any way that there needs to be some sort of leadership from somewhere else, even on MMA. Like Conor McGregor, when he's been talking about this, is that if somebody was to go out there and try and stop this, I would wholeheartedly support it. I would give my all to not having to go through this process. But when you're actually in the midst of it, you don't think of it. So it needs to be somebody in higher positions to step in and go, actually, we've had enough of this. We are making that change. But by the sounds of it, certainly in boxing, certainly in the fight game, there's no great desire to do it. It will come about when something really horrendous happens in, in a ring or an octagon when somebody when somebody loses their life that's 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 when like and then it has happened in boxing uh, particularly at the lower weight divisions where dehydration yeah. would have and, been and, a key and funny i'm just thinking about that andy mm. that one of the issues if you look we don't have a study where we took a person say that dehydrated say five percent and did a five fights in a row and then looked at their spinal fluid to see what sort of damage was it doing to the central nervous system. It's only when we start seeing that evidence is there, is there a certain cut point, and once you dehydrate below mm. that, you know, for, for you, that dramatically increases your risk for, 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 for brain injury. 
And would you do that research? Is that something you'd that, that, that's look research into? That, could, that could be done. Mm. You know what I mean? But whether you get ethics to do research to allow you to look to look at to dehydrate someone to a certain extent to see how much brain injury is going to occur, it'd be pretty difficult. Yeah, uh, I guess that's where horse racing as well now is starting to show a little bit of leadership in this because jockeys are never going to turn around. It's probably a sign of weakness if they were to go in and start requesting that the weight is put up because suddenly everyone would realise that they're struggling here. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And that is a big thing about, you know, if you miss out and you can't make the weight, you know, the trainer will just replace you and put another one on and then you're forgotten. You've lost out on the riding fee, a potential winner. So, yeah, it is often considered as a sign of weakness if you can't. You're just, if you agree to make the weight, you get down to that weight and you do whatever you can to get down to that weight. Yeah. We're on all our social channels this afternoon. If you have any comments, if you have any questions, please do get them in. And for anybody in the audience as well, we have a microphone that we go around in the next few minutes. If you have any questions at all for our panel, we are, of course, here we, because it's Science Week and we're here with Science Foundation Ireland. There are a lot of questions coming in already that I will get to. What is the science behind athletes wearing bin bags? Is it as simple as sweat more, cut more weight? Wonders David on Twitter. And they still do it. So many, like as in we were looking at with the jockeys that actually it. engage in strength conditioning and, you know, have a set plan. And there's only around 40 odd percent of them that actually do additional exercise right. to riding out, like to try and keep their weight down. And others did say that they still run with that sweatsuit or layers and... Is yeah. it some sort of YouTube algorithm that if you put in weight cutting, this is the it first works. thing that comes up? It works. <laughs> it, it just draws the, draws the sweat out of you. Like you would be so. What was your preferred method? <laughs> um, I, I used to put T-shirt, sweat gear, T-shirt, T-shirt, hoodie, whatever it was, layers. And then when I had to make the 11 stone, sweat gear straight on the skin, T-shirt, T-shirt, hoodie, hoodie, treadmill. Yeah. All right. Are you a fan of the saunas? I would, I, I would only do the sauna right at the end if I had to. Yeah, horrible. <laughs> but I would, I would, I'd always more than likely find myself in a sauna somewhere, yeah. Okay. I've heard of the jockeys in the sauna and you use shower gel because it opens up the pores and then you get a credit card and you scrape the shower gel off yeah. and you have a coffee cup and then you keep pushing whatever you scraped off into the coffee cup and then when you know you've, that cup is full, you just, you've lost a certain amount of pounds so they can leave the, the sauna there. The good thing about the sauna is it's a dry heat that you can actually gauge how much you're sweating, you yeah. know, because you're going in there completely dry. Um, in America, and do you cover we your head in ice so that you're trying to convince your brain <laughs> that actually your body's cold so that... No, you'd be afraid of absorbing any water from the ice. <laughs> <laughs> but like, in America, we used to uh, use this abilene. It was, um, it's a makeup remover, but it opens your pores the same way and it would make you sweat, you know. It helped you to sweat easier, so... Is any of that scientifically proven? No. <laughs> no. None of this is. But, but oddly enough, is. one of the adaptive responses of regular exercising is that you actually sweat more. Mm. <laughs> and Nathan, you spoke about running and sweatsuits, but running, when you go to the races now, you will see loads and loads of jockeys running around the course. There are some jockeys, Patrick Mullins, who's the champion amateur jockey, for instance, mm. every single day at the races, he will do at least one lap of the course after he, after he arrives at the races as part of his kind of weight control. So they are buying into... Um, they are buying into more modern exercise way, and diet as opposed to dehydration and then having a McDonald's mm. in the, uh, on the way home. The, I think the McDonald's, uh, Joseph O'Brien um, and Donica O'Brien, they're at the very upper echelon. They're riding the very best horses. So certainly for them to be able to ride a dirt, like Donica rode, I don't know, six, seven, eight, nine, ten group one winners this year. He had a phenomenal season. Um, for him to do whatever he needs to do to ride again next year and be on the very best horses in the world, that's, it takes incredible, incredible diligence and dedication from him. But the guy who's riding two or three winners a year and has one or two days racing every year, it's so much harder on them. Um, but if the whole group buy into exercise and diet rather than the ex extreme stuff, it can only be good for the, the and whole cohort. Ethically, as a doctor, when you're talking to these <laughs> jockeys and they turn around and say, well, I had a couple of jelly babies and a little cup full of Red Bull and that's all I've eaten in the last 48 hours, are you obliged to say this is not the way to go or um, do you just accept these are... Certainly, that is far from an ideal um, diet for, for a high-performance athlete. But, but not unusual for a but jockey. It's, it's not unusual, and particularly, the, the, for instance, the flat guys, some of their races last 60 seconds, and the horses are doing most of the work. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I might disagree. You, you don't say that to their faces, do you? No, but uh, you know, a, a lot of the, the flat stuff, it's skill and awareness and positioning. Um, 
whereas the national hunt, riding in a national hunt race, it's the Grand National is four and a half miles mm. long, and you can be pushing and shoving and expending vast amounts more energy. But the flat guys seem to be able to uh, to get by on much less. Would you agree? Well, we actually, uh, Mike E. Kiley is actually doing his research, and he's out of the races at the moment with the jump guys, and he'll be with the flat guys next year. But he's putting heart rate monitors on the guys in races and measuring lactate, like blood lactate, to look at the intensity and see how hard are the guys actually working, because we don't know at the moment. So it's very hard to come up with proper training guidelines if we don't know. And from what he's seen with the jump guys, like, you know, they're working over 90% of their actual maximum, so they are pushing out hard when they're riding. So they're doing a lot on the horse. <laughs> no, they, no Dan, you don't get me wrong. The, <laughs> the flat the guys... guys and exercise and really their base would be kind of low, wouldn't it? But you, if, you, if they were exercising a lot more, then they would be able to perform. I yeah. Think yeah. No, they're, perform all like, more. they're all extremely fit and they're mm. extremely fit for what they do. Yeah. So they could ride five, six, seven races in a day. They'll have ridden out that morning, maybe during the day again. Sometimes in the summer, they'll go from a mo an afternoon to an evening meeting, particularly in the UK. Um, where there's regularly yeah. racing in the afternoon and the evening. So they're, they're finely tuned Spot and incredibly specific. fit at yeah, what they're doing, yeah, yeah. but specific to mm -hmm. their... Yeah, excuse me for asking a stupid question, but if they're incredibly fit, do you not need to have a good diet to be incredibly fit? Are the two not linked? Uh, yes, well, no, they could be fit, but they just won't be making the weight. So, do you know, if you want to make the weight and be fit enough to race and recover over and over well, it's, again. It's like having a Ferrari car and very poor petrol in it. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? You have, the, you have all the raw material, yeah. but if, yeah. you, if, 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 the, if the food that you're ingesting, if it's not correct, it's going to affect performance, even though you are finely tuned. Yeah, yeah. they won't be able to keep going for sure. Uh, some of the other messages that are coming in. Why do fighters fight at a lower weight than desirable? McGregor looked daunt at his 145 weigh-ins. Much healthier at 155. Why do it to himself? Says Mary on YouTube. Well, as I said earlier, a number of reasons. Try, the biggest one is try to get an edge. Mm. Trying to have that physical edge where you're bigger you're the than bigger the man opponent. In the ring. Yeah, and, and, and that's a huge thing if you're fighting somebody. It's, if you're the bigger man, you're, it gives you an immeasurable advantage. Also, there's a number of reasons. It could be a fight is made at a certain weight. It could be for, for financial reasons that this fight is a lucrative fight. And, but the, the biggest one is the gain, physical, physical size. Uh, I know a few jockeys. Their diets are absolutely horrible. It can't be a healthy profession at all. Fizzy drinks and crisps are the staple for the couple I know, says Marcus on Facebook. Does that sound about right? They're getting a lot better, I think. Do yeah, you agree? Yeah, they, they're getting better, but there's still loads of work. And the race courses, you know, with their supply of food, there's been loads of work lately going around and making sure the actual food when they get to the race courses. I suppose Jilly can only do so much, tell it, giving them advice mm. on what to eat. But if they get to the racetrack, there's nothing there after their race. You hear most of them just after the race having been cutting for, you know, 24, 48 hours not eating. They get in the car and drive home and maybe get a big takeaway. So, <laughs> you know, that's not really the diet of an athlete, but at least if there's food there. Down to what, like where food is your only, like it's the only mm. thing you can get to really have pleasure in, you know, yeah. you can't, if, if they've got a race the next day, they can't go out and have a couple of beers or anything like so, mm. and if, like, uh, I might be able to eat these boiled eggs and, and boiled, boiled chicken breast and broccoli, but no, I'm just going to have a takeaway, you know, because I've earned it, yeah. I've raced hard today and I'll, I'll cut it tomorrow, it's always that like, I'll just get out, I'll do it tomorrow kind of thing, isn't it, it's just that, I think after all athletes who have to make weight, whether it be rowing or um, uh, horse riding or wrestling, they have a, very complex relationship with food, you know. And you often hear about that. They live out of, you know, petrol stations and takeaways because mm. their schedules are so busy. Mm. They might have to, you know, they're up at six driving to the race to ride work, then, you know, maybe going to a race meet, driving home. So they actually, they won't be at home for much time to actually be prepping food. So they, a lot of them live out of takeaways or petrol stations and try and get quick food. They are get, they're getting a little bit better. There's somebody, at, there's two girls at nearly every race meeting now monitoring what food is provided by the race course because there used to be a huge discrepancy and some tracks would have platters of food, you know, chicken wraps and um, hot meals. Other race courses would provide little or nothing for the jockeys and there's a real big push to get better food available to them. Certainly you can't control what they do afterwards. Um, there's the, during the winter, there's racing out in the all weather every Friday evening up in Dundalk. And that's kind of it for the flat jockeys for the winter because the rest of the time it's, ju it's jumps. And there's a Burger King on the Apple Green on the M1 kind of halfway between <laughs> Dundalk and Drogheda that at half nine on a Friday is 
very busy <laughs> with uh, people from the race. Certainly, I've popped into McDonald's on the way back from evening race meetings in the summer, and there's one in Athlone if you're racing in Roscommon or Galway, and <laughs> you kind of, oh, how you dock from one of the jockeys as you're walking out. So certainly, they're, uh, we're trying our best to, to get them to change their ways, but it is difficult, when Andy said, when they've yeah. been starving themselves all week. And, uh, and I guess that's, again, just the mental side of it, that because there's little research and there's more being done the physical effects the short-term and long-term effects we're still not quite sure of but actually the mental effects of cutting your weight are very real and our people are very much aware of them and actually if that keeps you sane going and getting that mcdonald's it's probably not the worst thing in the world definitely not <laughs> there was was a, advice, i remember hearing about a study of these two uh, lab rats and one was like fed really healthy stuff, you know, all the healthy stuff. And one was just let him eat what he want. And the one who was let him eat what he want lived a lot longer because he was happy. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and there is there's, there's a certain like there is a certain amount that you have to blow steam. You're in a you're in a pressured environment. You're like. You have to run it, like for those guys especially, yeah, they're like, they have to make way. They have to actually, you, you never uh, say that in Operation Transformation. <laughs> actually, <laughs> actually, research would tell us the opposite, actually. It's actually really? people who actually eat less calories live longer. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Believe it or not. I'm going with Andy. I'm going with Andy on but this I, one. I, I, I think Andy put, made a <laughs> really... <laughs> <laughs> I think Andy made a really good point. It summarises it for me. Like, athletes in these weight-type uh, sports, they have a very complex relationship with nutrition. And I believe with the advances in both technology and in science, I think it's going to take a lot of the guesswork out of it. And I think within a decade, you'll be individually tailored. Rather than Andy coming up with his own, it'll be individually what tailored for him. will be someone come along who will be so successful, and they say, what do you do to make a difference? Mm. And they'll, yeah. they'll cite yeah. guys and I, and like you, and that, everyone else will yeah. follow, follow the trend. But, 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 hopefully it'll, be, hopefully yeah. it'll be me okay. But I, I, I would definitely say in boxing, and I, I've noticed it over the last five years, the introduction of science to boxing is transforming boxing. Yeah. In what way? And it's training, number one in the training, they're really applying it. Boxing was an old sport, it was all, it was basically, you know, it, it was passed down from generation to generation. They're now buying into the concept that science, and if they think that can, science can give you a 3% edge, mm. believe you me, they're going to, you know, to adopt scientific principles. And that's going to w work its way throughout all of, of, of boxing and all the way down to nutrition. We do have a few more messages in, but I don't know if there's anyone in the room that has a question. Yeah, down here, what's your name? Uh, Dan. Who's your question for? Everybody? Uh, I suppose for Professor Moyne, I suppose. Um, is there, have there been any studies done on sort of the long-term effects on, for example, the kidneys for people who are, you know, uh, dehydrating themselves to that extent over a long period of time? Like, could you kind of look at a an apprentice jockey now and then follow him for his career and then reassess you know, and keep following up. Because surely that can't, like I know you can replenish the water and force the water in quickly, but like all the rest that goes along with like electrolytes and everything, that, like the balance, it hardly, like if you were to check someone's electrolytes fully before they cut or before they dry out, and then sort of 24 hours later, surely it's like, it's only kind of artificially replaced, you know what I mean? Like it's. Yeah, I think you're, you're hitting on all of the points that, were bro that, that, that brought this to the core in America in wrestling. That's exactly the issues that were occurring. There were kidney problems starting to evolve because you're concentrating your urine. You're, you've, you've less volume there. Um, and the kidney is, you know, a very, very complex organ, it can, organ, and it can really differentiate whether you're hydrated or dehydrated. And there was evidence that it was the cyclic nature of it, because in America they had to do it every week. These were collegiate athletes. They had to do it every Thursday and Friday, and they're doing it for a whole semester, and it was over the course of a semester. Now, boxers wouldn't do it at, at, at anywhere the same rate. So th there certainly is evidence in, in sports that if you do it on a regular basis that it ca can cause kidney and other organ damage as well. And then just a uh, quick one for Andy about um, in the weeks where you were sort of cutting and down quite low, did you find that it affected other things like sleep, for example, it was more difficult? Or? Well, sleep only in the l those 48 hours. Um, um, but over the years, you kind of learn to deal with it. But no, def just, just the constantly denying yourself things that you want. You know, because you still have to live a normal life outside, not so much, but outside the gym. Like if you go to the movies or you're just meeting people who you know, and you just have to say, no, well, I'll just have a glass of water. You know, they're having a coffee or whatever it is. And 
and just constantly denying yourself, denying yourself. But as I said, it, ha it's a, it can be used as a tool as well in, so in terms of motivation and strengthening your mental resolve. But it's it, like you have the thing when you're in, as soon as the, the fight is over, you just completely lose all control of yourself, you know, in a, in a way. How long does that last for? Uh, that goes on for a couple of weeks, and then you, have to, <laughs> then, then you think about the next fight, so then you have to, you know, have to rein yeah. this in a little bit, you know? Andy, did you use intravenous rehydration after the weigh-in? No, I, I, no. I'd done it one time in, um, in Chicago, no. Um, I didn't find a hell, I, I actually vomited straight away after, um, so I, I don't know if I pushed too much into, I don't know what it was, but I didn't find it found, found to help me at all. That's that quite common? Well, no, but in, in certainly in MMA, yeah. uh, in about a year ago or 18 months ago in MMA, they banned the intravenous rehydration after the weigh-in. Mm. Um, Conor McGregor used to have an Irish girl who kind of planned his rehydration of different electrolytes and fluids. And what's the issue with it? I, I'm, I'm not really sure. Uh, the, I think the, the, uh, the theory behind it was that you could, you could rehyd rehydrate through too rapidly and give them kidney failure. You agreeing? Would you have a major issue with it? I would, uh, unless it was entirely medically supervised. Right. I wouldn't, uh, you know, I'd have to be a physician. Yeah. Just when I would weigh in, like, when I felt like, after my years of experience, <laughs> trial and error, this is what I would, I would weigh in, obviously, I would be severely dehydrated, and I, w I would, I'd have a bottle of water and maybe like a, a sugary sports drink, and I would just sip them, but I, immediately I would have boiled white rice with, with some salt, with a salt sachet, I would just have, and I would just graze on that, maybe for about an hour while sipping, no, never gulping. And obviously you just want to eat and drink, but um, then maybe about an hour or two after, once that, that had been kind of digested and resolved, I'd have a meal, maybe like salmon, boiled salmon and pasta with very little sauce. And then in the evening time, maybe about 10 p.m., I'd have another meal, some sort of pasta and chicken again. Um, but all, once I'd gotten that initial meal out of the way with the boiled rice, I would be drinking then all the way sipping. Mm -hmm. What would you say, in terms of recovery from uh, dehydration. I mean, that's because it worked for you. I mean, mm. that, you know, if it works for you, and that's very logical, you, you aren't doing anything crazy there. You were taking good whole food, and that's, again, what I would suggest. There was nothing artificial, there was no lines in your arm, and that's what worked for you. Because even in solid food, there's lots of, 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 of fluid within solid mm. food, so you're getting it from that. Yeah, but ideally, in, just in a general term, what would be the, the well, perfect, I mean, I, I'm perfect sitting, rehydration strategy? Well, I'm sitting here listening to no. Andy saying... But if you had to, you know... Well, I'm sitting here listening to you, you're, you're, you're not sleeping, you're yeah. friggin' miserable, <laughs> you're in bad no, mood. I'm thinking about the jockeys. Why, <laughs> why, He's why a world champion, though. This, you know? <laughs> but, but the reason yeah. I'm saying this is, think about you preparing an athlete you know, for a major event and he's miserable, he's not <laughs> sleeping two days before, and, saying, um, and you've done all of this training. Mm. For me, it comes back to the, you know, the certain general principles that underline conditions science and, and sports science. And well, what about the glory? Well, yeah. of course. <laughs> and if it, when you uh, win. But, That's uh, what it's all But I think what science will do yeah. is it will increase the probability that you're going to be successful. It yeah. takes a lot of the guesswork so out what, of it. So what would be, like, just say that you have a guy, give us a general example, who's, who's lost three kilos to make the weight for a fight, and he has... 24 hours to rehydrate and refuel. What would ideally, what would I, you I, be? I think something very, very similar, to maybe mm. not as many meals, but something very similar. I, mm. I'm not sure if there's a reason, if there's a need for the very, the initial small meal. I don't think mm. there's any particular reason for that. Uh, and I think whatever works, I mean, because it's solid, nutritional food, I would, would have no problem. But gulping down, because if you drink too much water, you can, you, you, you can become hyponatremic, and basically your sodium levels can become so diluted, and your potassium can put you into cardiac arrest. Mm. So, you know, there's, there's, there's a fine margin, and that's why, you know, these things have to be medically supervised. When you were recuperating then, and when you were getting back up to weight, was it ever medically supervised? No. Or was it just guesswork? No, just eat something, stand on the scale. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 so, yeah, and you'd feel good about yourself every time you got a bit more weight, you know, like... And, and did nobody ever say... Maybe we could talk to a dietitian. Maybe we could talk to some scientists. There, maybe we could talk to some no, doctors well, and try and figure out something that does give us that age. Um, as not, not first and I said, there, there's huge. Well, traditionally there'd be huge pushback against science in Correct. boxing because yeah, yeah because yeah. they have their way of doing things. This way we've always done it, and it, they're very much set in their ways. Um, when I trained with Adam Booth, he used to be a lecturer in physiology, so he was very much advanced and very forward thinking in the science. And 
and that was a whole change because with a manual it was very much stay heavy, eat heavy. I would be eating a lot of like the night before a fight, I would have a full steak and big potato, like big heavy, you no, know, filling yeah. foods, and I, and I couldn't even digest those foods. No, I'd be still, yeah. just, I'd be so tired from the digestion of the food that it would take away from my performance, I would say. You know, and because th that worked for some of his athletes. Mm -hmm. I, I had a kid in, in Monaghan who many years ago went to, to a scholarship in America at Indiana University, and they had a brilliant runner there called Bob Kennedy, American intercollegiate champion, ran a number of Olympics. But every training session was geared around Bob Kennedy. So everyone had to do the same training <laughs> yeah, session. Yeah. But it didn't mean they were getting the benefit. And just because it worked for, you know, for your coach, for, it may not have worked for you. you know what I mean? So that's where, where I think science can certainly uh, uh, help. Yeah, we've one just down here. How you doing, Paul? There. Um, it's more a question, I suppose, with the MMA and the boxing sort of things. We see with MMA and boxing that they've random drug testing, um, and that's obviously to eliminate unfair advantages uh, within the ring. You could argue, I suppose, with the, with a weight difference of a couple of pounds or, or even a kilo or two, uh, that that's an unfair weight advantage. Would it not make sense then that they have random weight testing to uh, to, a stand, to to find out where your average weight is, and therefore you must fight at your average weight? It's a good good idea, but. I don't know. Like I, I would just say I would just can't see anything when there's so much money being made in these things. It's all there. Like MMA and boxing, they're also businesses as well as sports. And I think athlete welfare is probably down on the list of things mm. that that are priority to the people who are, who are in charge. Now, like in boxing, the IBF, if you fight for the IBF title, the next one you have to be within. They have a, you have to reweigh in on the morning of the fight, but it's ten pounds, so it's that's still enough. You know, it's not like three, two or three pounds the following month. So, and with WBC, when you fight with WBC belt, there's a 30-day weigh-in, there's a two-week weigh-in, a week weigh-in, and then the weigh-in itself. But generally, the weights are so far out, like the 30-day weigh-in could be 15 pounds. So they're not really restrictive enough to, to bring you down, you know, um, gradually enough to get you close to the weight correctly. I, I, I just see. I just don't see there being much of a change until something drastic happens in a ring or an octagon. You know. Would you think that the quality of the fights would increase though if athletes are are at a, their constant sort of top level of performance? They might. So you have two, you have two might, guys full. If you, ha you they might in one one sense because you'd have guys fighting at their natural weight, but then you'd also have people c coming down seriously dehydrating themselves to fight at that. You know, if they were to weigh in the day or right before the fight, and then the performance and the quality of the fight wouldn't be as good. I, it just, I don't know if there's an easy way around it. I don't know if there's if an you, easy way around it. But if you're not allowed to do that, you know, that's mm. the, and I agree with that point, you know, you take the average, I was suggesting 10 days out, mm. that's probably your ideal weight, and that you can't, you have to be within X percent of that on, on the night of the fight. I mean, it means that, that someone cannot come down then because it, obviously they were going to be at a higher average weight 10 days, mm. you know, so it, it means that people should be participating or competing in the events that they're ideally suited for. Yeah, we Just limit the, the weight you can put back on after mm. the weigh-in. Yeah. I would have thought you're, you're not allowed to put on more than eight pounds, you know, like I would struggle to put on more than eight pounds in one day unless I was in a starting point of severe dehydration. So if, if they limited that, would that be a way of doing it? So, okay, you can get yourself down a little bit, but you can't push yourself mm. to extreme um, because you're not going to go out and fight without putting, the, without putting the water back on or without hydrating yourself. It would be an interesting thought. way of doing it because they would have to balance that as well to make the fights a little bit more interesting as well. Yeah, I guess all these things you're saying, they, they could work, they mm. could be helpful, but... There's no great rush Without in either MMA or yeah. boxing. Why bother? Yeah. Just let it keep going the way it is. We've quite a few messages in on MMA. Lads, the video of Darren Till cutting weight should have been the end game for MMA. His current weight cutting measures are at least the moment to implement more weight classes. He came out of the sauna. He went blind for a few minutes, says Liz on Twitter. I was watching a video our own Niall McGrath did with Reese McKee, something very similar, just the extreme levels they've gone to. The general take from this, I would get, is that until something horrific does happen, nothing's actually going to change, certainly in the fight game. It will, yeah, it will take something like that and then somebody f from, you know, political world stepping in and trying to reg regulate it, but it's not going to change. I don't see a change changing anytime soon anyway. But you hear about those horror stories all the time in boxing. Do you see any? You see guys very, very weak, very, you know, very, like, it's all done behind closed doors. 
you know, those little videos um, that we've seen, they're an exception now, but I'm sure they're a lot more common because we don't see them all the time. Mm. And it's done behind closed doors, and you never know, like, just, and it's, it is, it's the sauna, it's the dehydration, it's the sweat gears, it's the plastic bags, and <laughs> it's just the losing weight and everything. I think that is us pretty much done for this afternoon. It's been a really interesting conversation. My thanks to all our guests, to Andy Lee, Dr. Niall Moyna, Dr. Richard Downey, and Dr. Sarah Jane Cullen as well. Thank you all for your contribution. Thanks to everybody as well for coming in. We have been here today because it is Science Week. We're here with Science Foundation Ireland. And if you want to get involved, Science Week's still ongoing. Use the hashtag Stop and Ask. Anything about the world around us at all that you want to know, just use the hashtag Stop and Ask and you'll get your answers there. Thanks, everybody, for coming along. Hope you enjoyed it. We'll talk to you again soon.